All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you can tell we really didn't want you to sleep very much this weekend. But thank you very much for joining us at this uh, early bird session. Um, and let me also say uh, a warm welcome to our young professionals who are uh, joining us here uh, today as well. Um, we started out our uh, Brussels Forum with a discussion on geopolitics and security. And in fact, we're going to continue that uh, and return to that theme this morning with a discussion on Russia, Ukraine, and the future of Europe. And we're really delighted to have Jill Doherty of CNN with us to moderate that discussion. So Jill, over to you. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. I have to get used to these microphones. They're, I, we decided that it's kind of like Lady Gaga type of thing. But in any case, I'm amazed that there are so many people here. It's really fantastic. And we have, I think, an, an amazingly um, high level, well, everything here is, but this is a particularly good group of people, all of whom have been actively involved in exactly what we are going to be talking about. So let me just move over here a little bit, get out of the camera. And, you know, um, the subject, obviously, that you want to hear about, and it's the subject that we are going to be discussing, is Russia, Ukraine, and the future of Europe. But as I went through some of the meetings and the discussions yesterday, I was thinking there are these overall broader themes that we're discussing. And as we all know, a world beyond disorder is the main theme of, of this entire forum. So if we look at where does that disorder come from, or at least a perception of disorder. I think you'd have to say that it begins with Russia's actions in Ukraine, at least in the Western interpretation of that. Uh, in the Western interpretation, President Putin, Russia, challenged the security order of Europe and the security structures of Europe post-Cold War. Now, there are different interpretations, there are different views, and certainly there, you could argue there are different values. Uh, the West would say that uh, President Putin is unreliable. The West does not know what he is going to do next. Look at some of the reports that came out about Syria and President Putin deciding to pull out some of his troops from Syria. And many of the uh, headlines were, what will he do next? Putin's surprise. Now, from the Russian perspective, they say they also know that uh, the motivation for the West is to damage Russia, hurt Russia. And in some cases, I've heard in Moscow people saying, destroy Russia and take over its natural resources. But in any case, right now, what our mission this morning is, is to get into some of these very difficult issues and try to figure out, is there a positive thing that we can move forward to? Is there some type of productive engagement possible? And briefly, you know um, who is on stage, but just to make sure that we have everybody identified, we have Igor Sergeyevich Ivanov from the left, my old friend, in fact, very good friend, uh, the former Russian foreign minister, and now he's the president of the Russian International Affairs Council, leading think tank in Moscow. Uh, we have Pavlo Klimkin, who is the foreign minister of Ukraine, Michael Turner, member of the US Congress, uh, representative from Ohio, and we have Witold Waszczykowski, the foreign minister of Poland. So let's begin. Igor Sergeyevich, I would like to begin with you. Um, getting back to that issue, that question of uh, what will Putin do next, or maybe put it this way, what does Putin want? Um, is, it, is it fair to say that President Putin wants to destroy the security structure and the way things have been done post-Cold War in Europe. Is that a fair uh, question? Does he want, as some people would say, a new Yalta? What, what would you say? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Julie, you mentioned uh, several times President Putin. We are not in presidential campaign. That's why I don't think that uh, I will concentrate my remarks on uh, one 
very important that political uh, figure here or in Europe or in the United States. You have campaign. Uh, we don't speak about your campaign, about the future of foreign policy of the United States. I think that we have topics uh, which uh, organizers mentioned in, uh, in the program, Russia, Ukraine, and Europe. And I will try uh, to give my vision about where we are why we are in this situation and where we are going. Because I think that uh, uh, it's clear that uh, for more than two years, dramatic development in and around Ukraine remained the focal point of the European politics. Even the bloody conflict in Syria and uh, the migration crisis in Europe couldn't put Ukraine on a back banner. I would not be an over exact, it would, it would be not uh, exaggeration to say that the Ukrainian crisis and its final resolution will not, will have a profound impact, not only on the relations between Russia and Europe, but also on the European project at large. Having said that, I would like to challenge a wide speed opinion that Ukraine was the main cause of the crisis in European relations with Russia. In my view, the Ukrainian crisis turned out to be a catalyst that exposed in the most dramatic way all the problems in the relations between Russia and the West that we preferred to hide or to downplay. As a result, we now run the risk of a new division of Europe. I'd like to bring your attention to the Euro Atlantic Security Initiative of 2013. It was before the Ukrainian <coughs> crisis. We had an important group of former politicians and uh, military people. That group was co chaired by Senator Nan, by uh, Lord Brown, uh, Ambassador Ishingen, and uh, myself. And, in our report, which we presented to the presidents of our countries in Washington, it was Senator Nan who presented to the administration. In Moscow, I presented to our leaders. In Europe, uh, our members of group presented. And in that report of 2013, we wrote, Euro Atlantic security must be improved or the existing risks will grow. The window for building trust confidence and security will not remain open indefinitely. Unfortunately, we were right. That window of opportunities for building mutual security in the Euro-Atlantic region was closed by the Ukrainian crisis. The key question for all of us, however, is not about who is to blame. It's very simple, as some people are doing, to blame President Putin. Unfortunately, simple answer is not the simple solution for the problem. The problem is more complicated, and uh, we, if we start to blame each other, it will be very interesting, maybe, story for mass media, but without any result. What we have to do is to analyze where we are and what can we do in this situation, which was created for many circumstances. Above all, above all, from my point of view, neither Europe nor Russia was anything to gain from Ukrainian became a failed state in the center of European continent. On the contrary, such a development would create a whole range of fundamental threats and challenges to everybody in Europe. The Ukrainian crisis demonstrated the current European institutional deficit. We are speaking also here in Brussels about European Union, about NATO and the, uh, uh, other European structures. Many European and Euro-Atlantic organizations and mechanisms were specifically designed to prevent or to resolve such a crisis. Please see again the declaration which we signed not we signed, we prepared as ministers, but uh, our leaders, head of states of NATO and Russia signed in Rome in May 2002. Why we created Russian NATO Council? The second paragraph, sp specifically speaking, that it was created 
to maintain permanent dialogue to avoid conflicts. And in the case of conflict, to continue such a dialogue to resolve that conflicts. What Russian NATO Council is doing, what was doing before the Ukrainian crisis, during the Ukrainian crisis, nothing. We should go, where should we go from here, where we are now? First, we have to admit that the paths of Europe and Russia are seriously diverging and will remain so far a long time, not for months or for years, but probably for decades to come. This continental shift, the drifting apart of the two European geopolitical plates, will have a huge and lasting impact on both Europe and the world. There will be no return to the autumn of 2013, even if the situation in Ukraine is, by some miracle, brought back to normal. The challenge taking place before our eyes are not only radical, but also irreversible, putting an end to some political projects and opening an opportunity for the other, for the other projects. When I say about uh, previous project, as you remember, many of, of, of us, we were speaking about greater Europe, about common Euro-Atlantic security space, about common humanitarian economic space from Vladivostok to Lisbon. I think that uh, beautiful plans, that beautiful plans we have to forget. We are in new reality and we have to to, uh, to, to start to think in that new uh, re realities. In the imagined new geopolitical reality, Russia is no longer the eastern flank of the failed greater Europe and is becoming the western flank of the imagined greater Eurasia. The shift of strategic essence means that Moscow should invest considerably political capital in developing the mechanisms of Eurasian Economic Union, Shanghai Cooperation Organizations, and other multilateral structures of Greater Eurasia. This doesn't mean that Russia should turn its back on Europe, renouncing interaction with European institution, institutions and partners. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, institutions which can today play a crucial role in, the, um, in assuring security and stability in the Atlantic, Atlantic region. Uh, Russia and uh, what, how I see today and maybe later we can uh, speak with more details, that Russia and, and West, and the West, appear to have entered a new phase of the arms race. Arms race? Yeah, arms race, in, uh, in, in which Europe has become the center stage. It can be assured that once the US deploys its missile defense system in Poland, for example, Russia would respond by deploying its own Iskandero, I don't know, I am not a military expert, missiles, uh, de um, uh, defense system in Kaliningrad region, for example. If the development take this direction, we may face a situation similar to the missile crisis in Europe back in mid-80s. You remember that crisis. But the big difference big difference between two situations is that at that moment, at 80s, we had the full scale of mechanisms of dialogue, of negotiations, of contacts on the highest level, on the level of military people, and we, with all problems, we managed that crisis. Today, all that mechanisms are blocked or destroyed. And the risk of confrontation with the use of nuclear weapon today in Europe is higher than it was in the 80s. And this is the paradox. Today we have less war, nuclear warheads and the risk of, use, of them to be used are, are uh, growing. 
And this is the dangerous situation for all of us. Um, uh, uh, this Peter is why... Sergeyevich, excuse me, please, yeah. but I just... In the interest of time, I wanted yeah. to keep things moving pretty quickly, and there's a lot... I can see that you have a lot of things that you want to address. You've painted a pretty uh, dire scenario, and I want to get some of the other people, obviously, on the panel to talk about this. You mentioned I, a failed... I wanted, I wanted to suggest how to resolve the Ukrainian crisis, but it, I, may, I can tell you later. I, the, okay. I, I, will this, put, I will put our cyber. But yeah, well, be... I wanted for 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 for, no, for, con for concluding my speech. I wanted to do something positive. But if you want to put no, no, it I'm aside, very, I will. I will, I will do it later. No problem. No problem. No, I will do it. But I, I wanted to just keep things moving because we okay. don't have a lot of time. Okay, no problem. But uh, I think it's a very very interesting. Yeah. At the beginning. So let's continue. Speaking of the Ukrainian crisis, <laughs> uh, Minister Klinkin, uh, Minsk II agreements uh, peace accord is stalled. And in these very halls, I've been hearing from uh, several people from both sides saying it's Russia's fault, it's Ukraine's <laughs> fault, it's, you know, whose fault. Why is it stalled? Is Ukraine doing enough? Is it that Russia simply won't allow uh, some type of ceasefire? Why are we in this predicament that it continues to fester? <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. It's great to have such a great crowd to focus on uh, Ukraine. Actually, yesterday we had a very sad anniversary, the second anniversary for the occupation of the Crimea. And after two years, the Russian goal <coughs> remained completely the same. And this goal is to kill off any possibility for united democratic and European Ukraine to success. Of course, we can discuss uh, geopolitics. I personally believe that Russia has been uh, trading with security like commodity on the stock exchange, creating instabilities here and there, uh, trying to sell and buy this instability, creating problems and telling the European Union and others, look, we have problems and it's only with Russia we, we can sort out these problems. But the point about Ukraine is not just about geopolitics. It's about us Ukrainians. It's about Ukrainian people. And my personal choice is to live in free, democratic and European Ukraine. I don't want to live in an unfree country, like Russia, for example. And it's the same choice for, for Ukrainians, for the absolute majority of Ukrainians. And because of that, we had uh, our Maidan. Because of that, we've been fighting all these two years against uh, Russian aggression. The whole idea about what was going on in Donbass is about trying to establish a mafia-style enclave by Russia and to push it back into Ukraine as a sort of Trojan horse to destabilize Ukraine internally. So the idea about Minsk agreements is simple and for me is very easy to implement. If you would like peace, what, you sh what should you do? You stop shelling. You let the OEC to control what is going on on the ground. You disengage forces. You let the OEC monitor what was going on along the Russian-Ukrainian border. And we've been having continuous inflow of everything into Ukraine. Imagine in Donbass we have now around uh, 1,500 tanks and armored vehicles. We have any kind of sophisticated weapons, including anti-air anti missile and other weapons. We have continuous inflow of mercenaries, munitions, and Russian regular troops. You know, thousands of Russian regular troops. It's not about 200 or 500 people. It's uh, putting a Russian regular officer 
in every military unit there to the level of platoon, because otherwise the whole system could not be guided in any way. And the idea is to try to exhaust Ukrainian resources, because now we have to allocate 5% of our GDP to security and defense, staying under IMF program. Why? Because we lost, because of the occupation of Crimea and Donbass, 20% of our industrial output. But we still have to allocate this 5% of GDP. And we will keep doing so, because after two years, we have real army, we have our <coughs> military forces able and capable to defend Ukraine. And the idea about Minsk is to go through security, through the gate array of elections, maybe not ideal elections, but still free and fair elections, under international control, according to Ukrainian legislation and according to the OEC standards. Russia kept saying for a year there were no OEC standards. So I showed the Russian leadership the famous decision of the OEC Copenhagen summit, 1990. And Russia was all over for, uh, for the OEC standards. What, is the, what are the OEC standards? Is to let political parties to participate in two elections? Seems fair. To let the media to, to participate in the pre-electoral and electoral process? To let the uh, interne internally displaced people, although I hate this bit of terminology, to participate in the elections, we have. Just imagine, in Ukraine, in the center of Europe, 1.5 million of internally displaced people. And they also have the right to, def uh, to define the fate of Donbass. But it's not only about Donbass. If you have political will to sort out the situation in Donbass, it could be done in months. Security, free and fair elections, and renovation of Donbass. But the idea to destabilize Donbass and through Donbass to destabilize Ukraine is there and top on Russian agenda, because uh, the Russian leadership wants us to push from the European cause and to create weak and fragmented Ukraine, which would be easier to deal with and to present Ukraine as a failed state. No way. But it's not only about Donbass. From the 1st of January, we have our free trade area with the European Union. And we got from Russia our punishment for that. Again, imagine, just three years ago, our economic turnout with Russia was 37%. Last year, 11 for the country with 45 million people. This year, it could be 4 or 5%. It's practically negligible. We have decoupling of our economies. Russia introduced most favored nature treatment, treatment, embargoes, any kind of prohibition of transit. Now, we've, uh, we have not been buying any Russian gas for the first time, actually, last year and this year. So we are in a completely different environment. But in the sense of commitment of Ukrainian people, there, there will be no stop in trying to build up Ukraine how we understand it. And we understand our Ukraine as united, democratic, and European country which could be the horror scenario, of course, for, for Russia in the sense of Ukraine succeeding in, in this exercise. But generally, it's about us Ukrainians to define what we could do and what we should do in the future in the sense of how to build our country, in the sense of our foreign policy orientation. And there could be no deals in this sense because the whole Maidan was the result of a real push to the, future, to the future Ukraine. So it's not about geopolitics. Of course, we can discuss geopolitics for hours now, but it's about Ukraine and Ukrainians, and it's about our drive, how we understand Ukraine. <coughs>
Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, get into another uh, question, and this would go to Congressman Turner. You know, last night we were talking about the word deterrence, which I'm sure everybody in this audience has some reaction to. Um, it's back. Deterrence seems to be back. Uh, we have the United States now in the budget that President Obama uh, proposed for 2017, an increase to $3.4 billion for the European Reassurance Initiative. Um, you and I were discussing last night, maybe we're headed in the direction of having more, and that raises the issue of what uh, Europe would do to respond. So. Um, uh, remember, uh, Igor Sergeyevich talked about nuclear weapons. I mean, we're into some very serious discussions about security. D could you pick up from there? Um, is this deterrence, is that what we're talking about? Is this a Cold War style deterrence? And what should the United States, what should Europe do? Well, I appreciate that. Uh, well, we're, we're not in a Cold War situation. We're in a hot war situation. They're shooting weapons. Um, that's a hot war. Um, I think for an, in a perspective of all this, we have to look at what is Russia doing and what is Russia saying. Now, what are they doing? Well, they've invaded Georgia. They're violating the INF Treaty by developing a nuclear weapon that, that uh, uh, has capabilities that they had uh, in that treaty agreed not to pursue. Uh, they violated the Budapest Agreement, violating the sovereign territory of Ukraine that was in exchange of their giving up their nuclear weapons. Uh, they're violating the Minsk Agreement. They've openly stated that they look to, um, you know, that they have a right to place nuclear weapons in Crimea, an area that Ukraine had declared as a uh, non-nuclear uh, weapons zone. Um, they're continuing to um, conduct military exercises, snapped exercises, and massive military exercises that General Breedlove says threatens both the uh, Baltics and um, are the type of exercises from which they initiated their invasion of Ukraine. Um, and what are they saying? Well, Putin is, you know, has said that uh, one of the greatest tragedies was the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, they um, openly now have said that, uh, that NATO uh, is uh, a threat to the Soviet Union, a defensive alliance. And um, excuse me, Russia. <laughs> and um, the, um, they've openly said um, um, that uh, in their military doctrine, they use the, the use of nuclear weapons as a de-escalatory effect. And we, uh, we believe that they're an escalatory effect. In all of this, you know, we have to look at both dialogue and deterrence. And in dialogue, obviously, we need to continue to be in exchange with Russia about what, how we see their actions and um, how they see their actions. But you can't exchange a portion of dialogue for a portion of deterrence. Uh, now, my Russian counterpart just said uh, that uh, you know, they're in an arms race. Well, we're, we're, we haven't been in an arms race. We haven't looked at what we need to do to deter Russia. NATO is a defensive alliance. And um, you know, a missile defense shield is a defensive uh, military uh, piece of equipment that's actually directed toward Iran, not, not Russia at all. Um, but when we look at what they're doing and we look at what we need to do, we've we made a miscalculation. We believed Russia was a strategic partner. Uh, they have looked at uh, NATO and their uh, European counterparts uh, as a threat and as the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union as a tragedy. Um, and because of that, they have destabilized um, the, uh, uh, the national security and international security structure. What we need to do um, is, uh, both through NATO and the United States, uh, to reinvest. Um, the Secretary General of NATO said yesterday that it's less expensive to um, prevent a war than it is to conduct a, a conflict. And that certainly is what we need to do. Uh, we need to make certain that Russia understands uh, that we have a military capability uh, to deter them, that there would be a price. You know, Russia has an economy the size of Italy, but currently today is fielding a military that can threaten the security of, of, um, of Europe. Uh, we need to make certain that we reinvest. The president has taken a first step. We need to make certain that uh, Europe is our partner uh, and that we once again look to what is it going to take to ensure that Russia uh, honors its international agreements and uh, uh, does not invade its neighbors. Let's turn now to Poland. And Minister Wojciechowski, um, 
what I'm hearing, and actually it surprises me, I must say personally, I think this is a very sharp discussion, and I don't mean that in a positive sense. I mean, what we're, we're looking at right now is a very stark explanation of how both sides look at this. Now, po Poland has a unique perspective. You've been listening to what everyone has been saying. Do you have any overall comments? And I, I do want to keep it brief because I want to get to the audience. I know people really want to ask questions. But what is your perspective on this? Is this irreversible? Are we now in a completely different world, which is more, uh, let's say, closer to the understanding that we had during the Cold War? What, what do you think? Yeah, very good morning. And uh, you asked me to even sharper the discussion. Discussion, I understand, because well, I, it's, oh, is it, <laughs> because like it is not sharp not, enough. But tell, it's not tell sharp me. Enough. <laughs> well, uh, let me start with clarifying uh, our opinion. Uh, there is no Ukrainian crisis. Uh, attempts uh, of uh, a sovereign country to to rebuild economy, to create a, a country which is based on the rule of law, uh, attempts to democratize country and bring country closer and closer to, to Europe and European Union. This is not the crisis. This is a normal choice of the, of the politicians who, who run the sovereign country. The crisis started uh, when uh, the, the neighbor attacked him and attacked territory and uh, supported the rebels. So let's, let's be brief and let's be uh, specific about the situation. Then uh, you asked the question at the very beginning what uh, Mr. Putin is up to, and you haven't got the answer. So Mr. Putin is up to recreation of a, a Soviet-style empire. Uh, according to the uh, most ambitious plan, he would like to recreate uh, Russia, which is equal to the United States less ambition program, he would like to create some kind of a 19th century uh, situation where Russia is uh, among uh, leading European powers, is running the, uh, some, something which, is, which used to be called in 19th century uh, a concert of powers. That's, that's a simple answer. And that, that means that they are trying to create some kind of an undemocratic system uh, that was clearly mentioned uh, a month ago during the Munich Security Conference when Mr. Wawrow and Mr. Medvedev claimed that we're supposed to uh, recreate the new uh, international order. Uh, it was already mentioned the uh, first time in 2008 in such a something which was called the Medvedev Plan. So, uh, the next question you ask about the deterrence. Well, I think that it's better to use the word prevention. Uh, we have to secure ourselves, we have to reassure ourselves to prevent any kind of a scenario they are just trying to implement against, against us. That's why, from our point of view, from my point of view of, of Poland, uh, we need to secure something which is called the eastern flank of NATO by military presence of NATO troops and by building a defense installation. That's a simple answer. Uh, doesn't mean to create any kind of a basis for military aggression against Russia, absolutely not, but it means to create a kind of a security devices to protect uh, Eastern flank, which is right now a little bit neglected, I would say, uh, after 1999 uh, uh, enlargement of, of NATO. That's a simple answer. That is a simple answer, but I'm sure we're going to make it more complicated with some questions. So, uh, plenty of questions. We have microphones, right? Uh, could we start there, please? Uh, thank you for a very interesting debate. Uh, could... Sergey Utkin, Russian Academy of Sciences. Thank you, uh, I, I have a question to Minister Klimkin. Uh, you spoke about the sequence of uh, steps that could lead to the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, but I do see that uh, there is a much deeper debate in the Ukrainian society, in the Ukrainian expert circles, on whether Ukraine actually needs the Minsk uh, uh, political program as it is set in the agreements, uh, whether it's in the interests of 
Ukraine to implement it as it is set in, in the document. Uh, so what's your vision? Do you think that uh, if uh, we have this prerequisite of a, a more calm security situation, if we have this prerequisite of uh, international control by the OC, in this case the Ukrainian society would be um, ready to accept uh, this model of uh, uh, semi-autonomous uh, Donbass and uh, to go this way of uh, constitutional amendments. Uh, do you think that this is still uh, the interest of Ukraine? This would be an interest of Ukraine if uh, these prerequisites are met. Uh, thanks for this point. Two, uh, two points from me. Uh, the real concern within the Ukrainian society is not about Minsk itself and not about uh, Minsk logic, but about uh, Russian unwillingness to deliver on anything on Minsk and trying to push forward a sort, a sort of special, unique Russian reading of Minsk, exactly in the sense what you've just said. We understand Minsk as a way from de-escalation, and again, it's about stop and shelling. It's about disengagement. It's about letting the OEC to control the situation on the ground and the Ukrainian-Russian border, and to deliver on pre-electoral security. After that, to organize free and fair elections, and to let the people of Donbas, not the people who have been put by Russia into the fake elections in November 2014 in power, but the real people of Donbas to decide what they're going to do, what they want to do with Donbas, and the, the way for them to create Donbas would be to have the possibility to organize life on the ground how they want it in the sense of economic activity, in the sense of the language to be spoken in every community. And it could be Russian, it could be Ukrainian, it could be Greek, for example. There is an important Greek community in Donbas. So it should be up to the people to decide. But it should not be any sort of semi-autonomous or any kind of region which would be a precedent and which would lead to a sort of uh, Russian-led or quasi-Russian-led mafia-style enclave to disrupt Ukraine and to destabilize Ukraine from within. And it's completely different reading. So the idea of implementing Minsk is easier if you have political will to implement that. The whole, uh, the whole possibility how Donbass could be retained under present situation is about Russian continuous and persistent assistance uh, to Donbass to keep Donbass as it is. And our vision is to try to gradually still to integrate Donbass. And the idea about constitutional changes, the idea about specificities of local governance is to reach to the people. Because the people uh, you know, have been tried, have been suffering there under Russian propaganda for, for two years. And we need to reach them. We need to explain to them it's up to them to decide how to live in Donbass. But not to create a kind of enclave, you know, to try to fragment Ukraine and try to weaken Ukraine further. I th there's a question over here. Do we have a microphone? This lady would like to ask a question. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerstin Born. Uh, I'm from the Center for European Policy Studies here in Brussels, one of the biggest think tanks. Um, I've listened carefully to all of you, and um, uh, to me, it seems that while we have listened to Dr. Ivanov uh, and you that he happy. said, "You are happy." <laughs> yeah, I heard you. So uh, I would be interested because I think you were stopped when you said, "Okay, but let's come to potential solutions based on the crisis that we have." Um, as there are three representatives of uh, the belief that we have or what we hear every day, I would be very interested to, uh, to listening to you to hear what you would suggest in the current situation. Because I hear about missiles being deployed uh, in Poland, etc., deterrence, and uh, having grown up in the Cold War, I'm very interested to potentially not ending into it. Thank you. Uh. I am a retired minister, but my privilege is and was 
that I was minister during the period when we signed a lot of important documents with our Western partners. Today, uh, some people very easily, we are partners or we enemies in 97, we signed founding act, Russia, NATO, by all leaders, American president, European president, were saying NATO and Russia don't consider each other as adversaries, we are partners. In 2002, the other paper, Russian NATO Council, again, we partners. It means it was not, the, it, 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 you cannot today say partners tomorrow, not partners, even having differences. We have to be serious when we really want to construct our relations on solid basis. Yes, we have differences. We had differences. We signed that partners after NATO aggression in, in, uh, in Yugoslavia. We signed that papers with the NATO enlargement. We signed that papers when the United States decided to leave anti-ballistic missile de um, uh, de uh, treaty. We had problems, we had differences, we had a lot of discussions. I discussed personally with three American administrations, but with all differences, we consider it was important to go ahead and to create real partnership after the Cold War. We started the limitation of nuclear weapons, limitations of conventional weapons. In 99 in Stockholm, I personally signed the adopted agreement on conventional weapons. We ratified Europe, NATO countries and the United States didn't ratify it. We never violated that, uh, that treaty on conventional weapons. Now we don't have such a treaty. We don't have conventional we don't, uh, in treaty we cannot uh, control. Now you ask me about maneuvering, but we don't have treaty. We don't have obligation as the other side to inform each other about such a maneuverings because we destroyed, not Russia, that, that treaty. Now what to do? I will tell you from my experience how we started after the Cold War. Because this is what sometimes I hear, not here, but in many other places. Okay, we will protect our borders. Okay, what does it mean to put more and more weapons, to put more and more military budget? We know it's not easy to, to read the history. We go up with arms, after that, there will be the moment when we'll have to go down. I, I, I remember how difficult it was to destroy a huge number of weapons after our agreement on conventional weapons, and how it was difficult after the uh, nuclear uh, missile crisis in 80 to destroy uh, small and medium range missiles. This is recent history, this is not the, the past. That's why w w we have to understand, this is no other way. Okay, you will go uh, growing with your weapons. Weapon today, weapons can protect you today. I don't think so, this is the other history. That's why, what to do? I will tell you my opinion. First of all, to restore dialogue with all differences <coughs> in family, between countries, or between other, it's necessary the dialogue if you really want to find solution. Without dialogue, impossible to find solution. I am a diplomat with 40 years of experience. I don't know any example when the uh, solution accepted for both sides was uh, elaborated. Second, we need dialogue between not only politicians and diplomats, but also between military people. When we created in 2002 Russian NATO Council, the first step was to send our military people to headquarters of NATO. Because to give them, to military people, chance to speak among them and to think and to understand better military doctrine, strategies and other things. We cannot, uh, I have uh, uh, my good friend uh, Ambassador Vesbo here. I, I know that some NATO people are saying we want selective partnership with Russia. It means we are ready, as uh, Magherini said about European Union, we will work with Russia where we see our interests. This is partnership? You, you think about the interests of the other side? <coughs> I don't think that this is a real partnership. That's why dialogue with all differences, trying to resolve, creating uh, um, mechanisms, uh, legal mechanisms to resolve them. 
looking where we have strategic interest, I am sure that we demonstrated with Iranian nuclear problem that it is possible to work together. Now we are trying to demonstrate this also in Syria. When my colleague minister speak about trying to demonstrate that Ukrainian problem is only bilateral, but Normandia format is with France and Germany. Why you never even mentioned the role and the position of France and Germany? Germany Why? did not invade Ukraine, and France did not invade Ukraine. No, 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 my dear, my dear friend, my dear friend, uh, we are not joking here, we are not joking here. I, I, I suppose that we have some people from France and, some, and from Germany. There, they participate in uh, the, uh, in, they signed two presidents, they signed in Minsk, Minsk agreements. No, not only Poroshenko and Putin. You have four signatures, and you, you also you have to say what is their position. This is not bilateral. You intentionally want to, to put it only on bilateral level. This is not. Uh, I will tell you more when I wanted to close my previous statement. I think that after uh, when we uh, finish, uh, I suppose positively Minsk agreements. The crisis will continue in Ukraine. This is my opinion. I don't interfere in domestic issues of Ukraine. And we will need to enlarge, to enlarge the contact group. And here we have uh, we, uh, we discussed uh, Dayton, uh, Dayton uh, conference and Dayton agreement. I think that the United States, they have to participate in a new contact group about uh, European Union. As European Union, they have to participate. Maybe Poland and Belarus as border countries. We need to create international contact group with clear intention to help to Ukraine to resolve conflicts. If you think that the conflict is only between Russia and Ukraine, I don't think so. But even, even if it's so, it's your interest to have broader international uh, uh, contact group to, to, to find prob solution for problems which are there. And you mentioned uh, sometimes mafia, some mafias group coming. Uh, creating the sense coming from Russia. Maybe we have, I'm not expert in mafia, and I'm not from police, and maybe we have, but I can assure we don't export can our mafia. The you have your mafias, and uh, 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 I think that you know them quite well. That's why, please, don't try to put all problems to Russia. Let us divide. Maybe we have our problems. Okay. Maybe. Let's, let's move on. Uh, one question. Yes, sir. Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform in London. We haven't talked about what's happening in Ukraine itself, so my question is for Mr Klimkin. Don't you think, Mr Klimkin, <laughs> the political class in your country is, is doing Putin's work for him? Aren't you uh, in, unwittingly helping Putin? Because you blew, the, you blew the Orange Revolution in 2004 because of the inability of the political leaders to work together, the awful corruption, and since the resignation of your reforming economy minister a few months ago, Mr. Abramovicius, you haven't had a proper government. It seems to me whatever the geopolitical situation that we've been talking about, unless the political elite in your country can reduce the corruption, work together constructively, Putin doesn't need to invade you again. You're doing your work for him. So can you reassure us that the politi he political them. class he them. will do something? Don't re yeah. Please remember that he invaded them. Yes, I, I, know, I know he did, but it, he doesn't need to invade them again if the political class can't make their country work. Right, right. And if I could jump in just before he answers. Um, you know, Georgia and Ukraine represent no threat to Russia. They didn't invade Russia. Uh, you can't look to a nation and say your own internal conflict is a justification for your neighbor to invade you. Um, and and that's, um, you know, that would be the excuse that, that Russia would give us. Um, the, um, neither of these countries represent a threat. Russia should withdraw from both. Uh, they've invaded two sovereign nations, uh, and that should be the beginning of the dialogue. Uh, two points on that. Firstly, Ukraine is indeed in a unique situation because uh, we have to deliver on our reforms under Russian aggression, and it's the first time someone has been trying to uh, pull off reforms in such a situation. Second, I can't agree more. 
because uh, we have some representative, including political representative, who uh, have been trying to put more accent on power than on the whole cost for Ukraine. But it's not about mainstream. And the point how to deliver on reforms, and I personally believe that what we have done in these two years is definitely more than what Ukraine, compare, comparing what Ukraine actually did in the last uh, 20 plus years in the sense of transforming uh, Soviet Ukraine and now post-Soviet Ukraine in a completely different country. Also, in, I, I, I personally believe that now we have actually three key priorities. And this year would be decisive in the sense of delivering on these three priorities. One is tackling corruption, because the institutional structure for tackling corruption is there. And, uh, the bodies on tackling corruption have been getting pace. Secondly, it is about complete reshuffle of Ukrainian justice system, because Ukrainian courts uh, was endemically corrupt, but Ukrainian police was endemically corrupt. And now we have the national police, uh, you know, completely different uh, from the time a couple of years ago. You know, let, let's take Ukrainian traffic police. There was an old joke, you know, about uh, traffic police getting bribes anywhere, and an old joke about do you have in uh, left turn here? Yes, but you have to pay for it. Now, in the last two years, uh, there are no bribes all around. So we have a really success stories. And the third point for me, really, is about devolution is about uh, getting power from clearly centralized situation to the regions. The idea of creating and uniting communities and the process <coughs> is underway. On this basis, we can deliver on any economic reforms. But the, the real background for reforms is about uh, our ability to deliver on these three points. And last but not least, because of the Russian aggression, it should not be an excuse not to deliver on reforms. Actually, I believe it's the other way around, because now we must speed up reforms in order to uh, completely transform Ukraine from the post-Soviet reality. Okay, thank small, you. Small remark. You know, in, uh, Georgia was mentioned here twice uh, in the case of Ukraine. I want to say, uh, I am half Georgian. That's why when I, I'm so sensible when uh, I hear something about Georgia. Don't compare Georgia with Ukraine, first point. Second, uh, um, I participated personally in all the period of transition, political transition in Georgia. And if somebody has interest, I can tell you all the history. Nothing to do to comparing with Ukraine. They said, it's, you have the report of OEC that the military operation in Ossetia started by the troops of Saakashvili. That's why don't s compare one and the other. And speaking about Ukraine, interesting Minister, story. I, I think we have to keep moving. Yeah? Okay. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. But a lot there of are interesting a lot stories. Of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, David. Mayor with the McCain Institute. Uh, Mr. Ivanov, uh, first of all, it would be good if uh, Russia left Georgia, it still occupies 20% of its territory, and if it filled fulfilled the uh, agreement in 2008, that would be a good step. Second, back to Ukraine, it's not a complicated story. It's very simple. Your country invaded Ukraine wholly unprovoked. You annexed Crimea illegally. No country in the world has recognized that annexation. You then moved into the Donbass area. Which uh, conditions under the Minsk agreement has Russia fulfilled? It seems to me none, including, by the way, the return of prisoners, including Nadia Savchenko, who was kidnapped from Ukrainian territory. When will she be returned? And when will your country live up to the obligations under the Minsk Agreement? Thank you. you <laughs> excuse me, you are from where? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, uh, delegations working permanently in Minsk, on, on Minsk agreement. 
I professionally, I don't think that it's good to interfere in their job. We have President Kuchma, other high-level people discussing the agreement and, and the uh, implementation of that agreement, and this is their job. But when you profes professionally use terminology, you have to be responsible. Invasion. What does it mean, invasion? For me, invasion was the invasion of the United States in Iraq. It was invasion. For me, invasion was the invasion of NATO and Yugoslavia. It was invasion. In, in Crimea, it was not invasion. It, uh, you, I can tell you of the history. I, 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 when I start, they stop me to tell you. But the, the, uh, in 99... What about maybe, Russian troops well, I will tell you. I will tell you. Uh, no, give, if, you, if you want, I can tell you. It was in 99... When you were not minister, I was minister. In Duma, I presented the agreement between Russia and Ukraine, ratifying, recognizing the territorial integrity. And I can assure you, give me one example, one example only, when on official level, Russian side uh, put under question the, uh, Crimea, the uh, Crimea as part of Ukraine. Of Ukraine. Never. Never. I, I'm, I'm no, confused. no, no, I'm don't, confused. don't, if no, you don't. Russia has annexed Crimea. Look, 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 uh, <laughs> look. Mean, you, you occupy look, it and uh, took look, it as look, part look, of your look, own no, nation, no, 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 and you're doing no, no, the same no, no, no. in Georgia. If, if, what, if maybe what part my, of that may, is? I, I, maybe my English is not good, but I can repeat you. Maybe okay. I can repeat you. What I, what I am saying is that till uh, uh, February 14, never on official level, we had a lot of discussions about fleet, about this and that. Never the problem of Crimea was discussed on official level between our two governments. I worked with uh, Kuchma, with Yanukovych, with Yushchenko, with Poroshenko, we were ministers together, with Yutsenyuk, we were ministers together. Ask them if, if you don't believe me. What happened in I'm Crimea... Confused. Are you trying to say it was part of Russia before you had no, a no. referendum? Because I, I, I don't know why you'd have a no, referendum no, what if I, that what was I'm already saying, part of Russia. What I'm, saying, what I'm saying, what happened in Crimea, this is direct consequences what happened in, in Maidan in, in Kiev. This is what I'm trying to explain you. It was not... I repeat, about Minsk, you may ask the people who participate in dialogue. I am not a <coughs> member of Russian or Ukrainian delegations in Minsk. Oh, so this is what I am trying to explain you. Okay, well, this is a good example of what's happening, unfortunately. But uh, let's move to another question. Sir, yes. Uh, Shota Green Area, Georgia. Uh, definitely, Georgia is different from Ukraine, but what is similar in Georgia and Ukraine is that Russia is trying to undermine the democratic processes and integrational processes in these both countries with the uh, European and Euro-Atlantic structures. And Russia is using military force to undermine that processes effectively. And now what we've heard from you, sir, yeah. The distilled message is that the only way to normalize relations between the West and Russia is for the West to recognize the spheres of influence that you claim, using that hybrid warfare uh, type of <coughs> tools to pressure politically, economically, and militarily your neighbors. So my question is, is it possible that in this 21st century, the sovereign nations uh, territorial integrity and internationally recognized borders could be undermined by its neighbor and the Western free democratic society can ever, ever live with that and ever even indirectly legitimize that. Thank you. Uh, you are from Georgia? Yes. Okay. Uh, so what? Do you, remember, do you remember the transition in Georgia from uh, Shevardnadze to Saakashvili? Do you remember that I was personally there? Do you remember that uh, we personally, uh, Russia, helped the peaceful transition from, <laughs> from one... Do, you don't... You don't... <laughs> this is... This is... This is... That's why... This is why... This, that's why you remember what you want to remember. Uh, it, this is... This is... No, you are laughing. Do you know... Maybe you know 
that personally I negotiated with Saakashvili with the withdrawal of military bases, Russian military bases from Georgia? Do you know? No, okay. Do you know that we uh, helped to Georgians, many Georgians, to come to <coughs> Gali, to Abkhazia, refugees? Do you know? Ah, yeah, th this is the problem. If you don't know the history and you start the history from today, this is very difficult to understand what is happening. Russia was trying, the first question, I can tell you, the first question of Saakashvili after taking power, and you may ask him, he is in Odessa now, not in Georgia, but you may call him. The first, <laughs> the first question was, Igor, help us to restore the territorial integrity. And I said, yes, we will. We are ready to help you. We are ready to help. Look, look, look. Uh, the, we are not in the theater. If you want to applaud, maybe in the other play. I am, I am telling, I am telling how it was. If you want to know, it's okay. And we said yes, but the the restoration of territorial integrity is the job of authority, of authority of Georgia. We are ready to help you, and we were doing this a lot. We were doing a lot. But instead of this, what, what happened in uh, Adjaria? They eliminated the autonomy of Adjaria. Bad example for Abkhazia and for Ossetia. OK. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think maybe we've got to hey, okay, we'll okay, leave okay, Georgia okay. for a second, please. Yes, sir. Christoph von Marshall from the German Daily, der Tagesspiegel. First of all, I would like that Charles Grant important point uh, is not forgotten. Ukraine is a difficult partner for the West and is not living up to our expectations and to the challenge which is posed to the country. But my main point is about Russia and all our Russian guests, whether it's Brussels, whether it's Munich. For years now, we hear always the same speeches about the West not living up to the partnership and all your complaints. And I would like uh, that uh, Russia takes its own warnings finally serious, that here a partnership is unraveling, that maybe we go to an arms race. And I ask myself why the Russians are not taking these warnings serious. If I look at the situation, Russian behavior has consequences. And you can see it in my country, Germany. We had a very friendly, Russia-friendly public opinion years ago. That's over. Today, 80% of the Germans say Russia is not a trustworthy partner. A majority of my uh, fellows say, country fellows say, that we need to increase the German defense budget. I haven't that seen for my whole life. So if you want to have an arms race, or if you warn against the arms race, now good luck. That worked very well for the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And do, if, you, do you have a question? Yes, I, I, I do have. I, I, would, I, would, I would like to know when Russian, our Russian guests understand that this kind of warnings fall on deaf ears for good reasons and that we finally should ask ourselves how Russia has to change behavior in order to come back to a real partnership. With oil prices of today, you can't go with 3% of world GDP against the whole West with 45% of world GDP. It just does not work. Can I jump in? Minister Vashtikovsky, we have not heard as much as I would like to hear from you. Could I defer, Igor Sergeyevich? Could you just If he also I am, I am, I am, I am, it will be a pleasure. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think it's, it's worth hearing yeah. something from you. Yeah, I, I think that Russia is not going to help us, because I'm, I'm, I will start to to be afraid of this, but uh, I just I just wondering because uh, Mr. Minister uh, uh, introduced himself as a, as a retired minister, a retired diplomat. So maybe you have a little bit more space, more margin to be less diplomatic and answer a simple question: What will satisfy Russia? What kind of a position will satisfy you? You you are the member of a Security Council as a as a permanent member. You are the member of a G20. You have a privileged relationship with European Union and NATO. You're part of every regional structures. Middle East Quartet, uh, talks on Iran, talks on North Korea, whatever, on Arctic. You are part of Normandy formula, Mies formula. What else? What else will satisfy you? On what, what else will give you the right to, to cooperate with us and stop claiming that we are threatening you? Uh, okay. It was because <laughs> answer, then, then because answer a question. Yeah. Please, please. No, please if you could what? briefly. 
No, I mean, do you want to answer? Uh, should we no, move no, to another I will start question? with uh, John. But if you could keep it John. brief, we have literally five minutes. Brief. Well, uh, very, very brief. I think that you asked about partnership. Partnership as uh, marriage, as family, it has to be to both directions. Uh, this is the, the big problem. I will, uh, uh, and the problems, as I tried to explain before, not started only with, uh, with Ukraine. It started before, we, in our context, with NATO, with European Union. There were growing problems, and we, the, the gap between words and uh, what in real life we saw what, was growing. And uh, I can give you a lot of examples. I don't have time. That's why Ukrainian crisis demonstrated how, uh, how partnership was failing, our partnership, real partnership. That's why now ask me if we are interested. We are interested in partnership because we are living in the global world and we perfectly understand that economically, politically, security, we need to cooperate. But the cooperation has be, not been unilateral. It can be only bilateral, understanding each other. We demonstrated that it was possible. After September 11th, Russia was the first country who said, we are ready to work with you against terrorism. And we worked together, participated in the operation in Afghanistan and, the, and in other places. That's why partnership <coughs> is in our interests. In interest of our economy, in interest of our security. But unfortunately, what is happening in, Ge in Germany, the same thing is happening in my country. Young people, now they don't have so big interest to European projects that it would be... After when Soviet Union disintegrated, young people thinking about European project as the project which was the best for them. Today it's not so. It's not, it's not so. And this is bad. Not for my generation, but for young generations. That's why what we need to try to, to, to change the direction of development. If, and I, what, if I could admit, if, if I could admit, he was saying, you know, partnership is the issue of understanding each other. And, and I think in, in understanding each other, we've, we've made a mistake. Uh, we believed um, that we were undertaking uh, the, the project of peace and prosperity together. You know, if you put up a picture of that, the people who were with their own hands taking down the Berlin Wall, we see the, the accomplishment of the human spirit. We see liberty and freedom. Um, we believed that we had done that together. When we talk about the Cold War being won, we believed that Russia and the West did it together, and the end of the Cold War was the end of oppression of, of people. But the reality is, is that Russia didn't help us take down the Berlin Wall. They merely didn't shoot people who were doing it. And today, they have leadership that when they see that picture of the Berlin Wall, see tragedy. Um, we see it as, that the, um, as, as an accomplishment that we should be able to walk together in. Uh, until we can return to that, until the leadership of Russia actually sees uh, freedom as a partner and the lack of oppression of other people as a partner, um, and um, sees its neighbors not as a threat but as neighbors, um, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, you know, we'll have difficulty in having that partnership. And the point, we, we even can't agree on the whole definition of partnership with Russia, because for me, trend, a partnership is about trust, and partnership is about playing by the rules. And for Russia, it's about living in, in Russia's own world, and Tigre is probably, sorry for this point, is the most moderate in uh, in the Russian reality, and so in you the, see this, the understanding in this, in this power. Group. <laughs> in this group, definitely. In this group, definitely. <laughs> Okay. Well, actually, on that note, it is. I'm, I would like to continue this for another hour, but we can't. No, so I wanted to thank everyone. You know, the, the one thing that did disturb me, however, Igor Sergeyevich, is that you talked about a failed Greater Europe, and I hope I hope you're not right. I hope that there is some type of Greater Europe that can include Russia and not fail but succeed. But that's that's for another discussion and another day, or maybe more today. So thank you very much. I'd like you to thank our uh, wonderful panel. Jill, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, that was really terrific. Um, <laughs> Um, we're going to continue our conversation with another critical theme, energy security, transatlantic energy security at a time of global turmoil. Uh, we're going to, we're actually, let me, let me just mention that we're not actually having a break. This is seamless. 
It's seamless and it's also going to be extremely good. So please do stay with us. Please do stay with us. The next session, please do have a seat. Please do stay with us. If you would, if you would have a seat. Um, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, do please have a seat uh, because they're in fact